Hello, I'm Larry Medowo, live at CNN headquarters in Atlanta, and this is One World. Fearing for their lives under Taliban rule, they're risking their lives trying to escape. Reuters reporting now at least 12 people have been killed in and around Kabul's airport since Sunday. Some by stampedes, others by gunfire. <laughs> These new pictures show the chaos at the airport's perimeter. Huge crowds of Afghans desperately waiting to get in, but they cannot. This is a crash at one entrance. The Pentagon now saying multiple airport gates are open and it's flown out some 7,000 people since Saturday. It's a catastrophe. And so for people who are sitting there, camped out on the ground, waiting for their turn to leave, that looks like it's not going to come. What city are you presiding over when it's so chaotic, as our Clarissa Ward has just been describing? How do you run a city where many people are trying to leave? Who's connect collecting the trash? Who's in charge of just making sure that the normal running of a city does go on. Are you that person or is it the Taliban? Well, um, uh, this is a large city, uh, an airport, as you described, and uh, just the vicinity of some embassies. This country has changed, the world has changed, okay. and the uh, expectations of the world have changed, and I hope that they will also realize those things. Mayor, many thanks for coming on to speak to us. Um, all the best trying to run the city. And CNN's Nick Payton Walsh has first hand experience of the chaos around the Kabul airport and the ongoing evacuation efforts. And Nick now joins us. You've just flown from Kabul to Doha. And we've all seen those pictures of the absolute pandemonium at the Hamid Karzai International Airport, which the US military is running um, the air traffic control and essentially in charge of these evacuation flights. And the question people have, Nick, is why, why did the military abandon? the Bagram Air Base, which is an area they had control over and could have provided this other entry point or other exit point out of Kabul at this very difficult moment? Well, I can't speak to their decision making. At this time, they appear to be moving significantly less than they want to and not even knowing how many priority American citizens are actually coming. Larry? All right, Nick Payton Walsh for us in Doha, where some of these people being evacuated from Afghanistan from Kabul are ending up. We have more from the Pentagon a little late in the program. But first, Europe's top diplomat has called the situation in Afghanistan a catastrophe and a nightmare. In a grim statement, he warns that the EU cannot take all Afghan people out of the country and says there are still hundreds of EU staff who are struggling to get out. There are still 300 more. More than 900 people have now been evacuated by Germany, according to its defense ministry. While these pictures show the latest arrivals to France, Paris says it does not have a cap on number of Afghans it will evacuate and is working out who has the most pressing needs right now. Let's speak now to Melissa Bell, my colleague, who is live with me in Paris. Realistically, how many people can the EU take? Because we're already seeing a warning from Greece saying they're going to be tightening their borders because they're trying to avoid a situation like in 2015 after the crisis in Syria, where the EU was just inundated by refugees that the countries were just not willing to take. So are they looking at this situation and saying, OK, we have to figure out how to manage the situation better? That's right, Larry. There is the initial frustration that you heard expressed there by Joseph Borrell. Uh, European allies, the United States, frustrated at the immediate difficulty of getting not only their nationals, but as he just said, those many Afghans who've helped uh, their nationals over the years. A second migrant crisis looms, Larry. All right. Melissa Bell in Paris for us. Many thanks. Back here in the U.S., President Joe Biden vowing to get all remaining Americans out of Afghanistan even if it means extending the withdrawal deadline less than two weeks away. But he isn't making the same promise for America's Afghan allies. But the idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing, I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happened. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. Let's go to CNN's Jeff Zeleny joining me now live from the White House. It's extraordinary to see President Biden insist that this was always going to be chaotic and it could not have been handled better. And yet this interview with ABC News was supposed to be a chance for him to clean up his initial address about Afghanistan where people felt he didn't show enough, he didn't take enough responsibility. And yet here we are, not much has changed in the last few days, Jeff. 
Larry, it's certainly clear that President Biden is still trying to focus on the overall strategy of withdrawing American troops from Afghanistan rather than the crisis that is indeed unfolding. Jeff Zeleny, uh, other White House, many thanks. Coming up, the crisis in Afghanistan coming against the backdrop of another crisis there, COVID. Next, we speak to Doctors Without Borders. Hello and welcome back to One World. I'm Larmido in Atlanta. The Pentagon says August 31st is still the deadline to withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan, at least for now. But if that changes, the Taliban would need to be consulted. Speaking a short time ago, spokesman John Carby said the focus is getting as many people out of Kabul as possible. So it's something we're looking at literally hour by hour. We're joined now by Pentagon correspondent Barbara Starr. We were just speaking a little early on the program, Barbara, with Nick Payton Walsh, who's just left Kabul, and he said for him, the most extraordinary thing from this briefing is that the U.S. is not sure how many Americans are in Afghanistan that need help. And so the Pentagon is under pressure here, managing what has the past few days were really catastrophic, as everybody agrees. So they need to manage that better and still get everybody who needs to get to the airport to get there. What have we learned from this latest update? Well, uh, you're right. I mean, still, the official deadline is August 31st, and the spokesman at the Pentagon, John Kirby, uh, clearly indicated that if, if there is a decision to try to extend that, they're going to have to talk to the Taliban about that and essentially, uh, for all purposes, get their agreement to allow the U.S. troops to stay. There are now F-18s flying over the airport, essentially armed F-18s on watch uh, to try and be an extra layer of protection against the airport, be able to defend U.S. troops on a moment's notice if a threat emerges. Larry? All right. Many thanks, Barbara Starr at the Pentagon for us. The UAE is playing a major role in helping transport evacuees from Afghanistan to the UK. Time now for the exchange where we take a look at Sharia or Islamic law and the Taliban's interpretation of it because that's where it's at, interpretation. Ed Hussein is the author of Among the Mosques, A Journey Across Muslim Britain. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and he joins me now live from London. You tweeted, Ed, after the Taliban gave their first press conference uh, and given these assurances that women will have their rights, you said, translation, women cannot inherit equally, be equal witnesses in court, travel alone, lead men, divorce independently, wear clothes of own choice, or choose a male-dominated profession. So how did the Taliban end up following this very strict version of Sharia? That's a great question, Larry, and that's the question that we should all be asking because the future of Afghanistan will be determined on the basis of that interpretation of Islam or Sharia. And that comes from the 1860s in India, where the Taliban, uh, Taliban's mothership, if you like, the Deoband movement in India was started in order to oppose and destroy the British Empire. Now, sadly, we're in a world in which the ugliness of text without context dominates our narratives. All right. Professor Ed Hussein, that was an excellent class on Sharia and uh, what it means for Afghanistan now that the Taliban are in charge. Many thanks. Thank you for joining us. Larry, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We'll be right back. Thank you for watching One World. I'm Larry Midowo. Amanpour is next. Stay with CNN.